you make a mistake, you get walked into a room by your best friend, you don't walk out again. When you have revenge in your heart, you might as well dig two graves, one for you, one for them. It takes you on a tailspin of uh, terrible life. We all have past, but you can do something to present and future. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Millennials Choice Show. I'm your host, Matthew Ablican, and I'm here with my brother from the same mother, as far as we know, <laughs> Danny Ablican. What's going on, everyone? And we got a special guest in the house today, and we're really excited to hear his story, hear how he's turning his life around and the positive impacts he hopes to make in the community. But we want to learn from his story. We don't want to glorify it. He doesn't want to glorify it. And we just want to make sure we hear from his past if you guys are listening to this, you may be at a crossroads in your life. You may be, you know, thinking about going down a path that's going to have a huge negative impact in your future. It's going to be detrimental to your life. Kurt's going to share his story. So we want to welcome to the show, Kurt Calabrese. He's the former mafia, mafioso, mobster for the Chicago uh, mafia. And, and he's got a tremendous story. So we're excited to hear it today. Kurt, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We're, we're glad you were able to come on. Uh, it's a very smooth process, and I got a chance to speak with you before, um, and, and I, I'm excited for this. I know Danny's excited I'm for pumped. this, too. Can't yeah. wait. So we want to get right into it, and for those of you, or for those people who don't know who you are, have never heard your story before, why don't you take us back to the beginning of your childhood? What was your childhood like? Where did you grow up? You know, when did you really realize, like, okay, my family is part of something that you know I, I I'm not aware of until now and it's it's uh it's it's real it's happening when did you realize that so let's start from the beginning okay uh, I grew up in a in a mostly Italian neighborhood just outside of the uh, city outskirts of Chicago the town was called Elmwood Park uh, grew up there grew, like I said a, a big Italian neighborhood. Uh, a lot of friends, very a, a nice, a great place to grow up. And uh, I would say people started talking about my family, more about my family to me, probably when I was 14, 15 years old, 13 years old, somewhere around there. Uh, I, My father, who was a, a boss in Chicago, he was a capo, uh, very, very powerful man, very serious man, uh, decided that at some point decided he wanted to bring his family, more of his family into the life. Uh, my uncle was part of the life. My, my father brought my uncle into the life, uh, brought myself and my brother into the life. Uh, and with me, it was different because I didn't want anything to do with that life. Uh, I didn't, I didn't enjoy being around it. And the reason being is because my father was a hard, very hard man to get along with. And seeing him as my father that way, I, I did not want to be around him in any other manner than just being his son. And so I, I kind of fought tooth and nail to, to, to try to keep myself away from that. But unfortunately, my father had different plans. So, but, but I, I've never, you know, anybody who knows me or anybody knows what I've lived knows I did not want to be part of that life. And again, that wasn't a, it wasn't that that life wasn't glorious where I grew up at, you know, it was cool to be part of that life. But unfortunately, like I said, because of my dad being the way he was, it didn't, it wasn't attractive to me. In fact, I, like I said, I wanted to get as far away from it as I could. And the more I tried to get away and pull away, the more my father refused to let me, you know, I, as a kid, I, we, we talked about going to college as most kids do. And so I thought that was the, my plan. But unfortunately, I was told point blank that if you want to go to college, you're you're going to stay right here and and go to a college and live and live at home. So that kind of blew my plans to get away from my dad. So we have family in Chicago. They live in Skokie, Illinois. Is, is that close to where you guys were? How far was it? That's very close to where I'm at. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. And so your your dad is this figure that you you're obviously growing up with. He's your father. And he has this other life and now he gets you into the business. 
How does that happen? I heard on our friend Michael Francis' show, you were on that show. Uh, great interview. I encourage you guys to watch it. But you guys were, you know, talking about this and you started, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you know, working the books, right? The financing, the financial side of things. Yes. yes. So how did yes, that happen? I, I, well, I was told that I was the smart one in the family. Educational wise, I was the smart one in the family. So I kind of got drafted into doing that. And the mistake my father made is, and he only made it once to me my entire life, was asking me if I wanted to do it. And when he asked me, I had the opportunity to say no, because I didn't get that opportunity very often. So I told him no. And he didn't like that. He was very angry about it. And a couple of days later, he he basically told me, let's go, because we lived in a three flat and my grandparents lived upstairs. It was a three uh, apartment building. My grandparents lived upstairs, but my grandmother had an extra bedroom and that's where we did the paperwork at. So he got, I got whistled up there, let's go, you're gonna do it. So the the asking me from there on in never never happened again. It was, I, now I was told what I'm gonna do. So that was the first step of that. And then it was, you know, it took me a while to learn how to do that because, you know, the, it was more complicated than I thought. So you're saying this was when you were a kid. Were you like in high school or because you were talking about college. So I, I imagine you're a little bit older, right? No, high school. High school. Okay. It was high school. No. No. Did the people who knew you like in high school, like your friends or even people who weren't your friends, like just people you saw in school, did they know who your who your fa family was, who your father was? In grammar school, yes. In high school, Yes. Um, because the high school we went to a Catholic high school right there in, you know, in the town I grew up in, um, a lot of people came from a lot of different areas to go to that school. And in the area that I grew up in, the towns around us were also, you know, mostly Italian. And there was a lot of organized crime, you know, guys, fathers, guys, uncles that were in that life. So I didn't realize it when I went to high school that people knew it. I didn't realize it until after high school when I still see people I grew up in high school and now they tell me things that they didn't tell me much in high school. I didn't discuss many things with people. I, I kind of kept my, kept closed, my mouth closed, kept to myself. And that's how I, I've always been. But, um, and there were other guys, like I said, there was other guys in school whose fathers were involved, you know, in that life. And, you know, I got along with everybody, but now, like when you, when you hindsight, when you go back and look, that was, yeah, there was a lot of people who did know, and but didn't talk about it, didn't bring it up, didn't, you know. Is is the Chicago the Chicago mafia like was it was it just like how the New York mafia is portrayed and in terms of not in terms of the violence, but in terms of the lifestyle, you know, the cars, the women, the money, the power. Is that is that what it was like? It it not really in Chicago it was different. Um it, it it, there was only there's only one family in Chicago and a lot there were different crews and different crews handled things different ways but my father and the people that he was around everything was about blending in everything was about not drawing attention to yourself or attraction to yourself so that's how we lived our lives no fancy cars no fancy clothes you know that's how we 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 lived our life that's how we you know we're, we're raised we're taught and, you know, it makes more sense to me to live that way than it is to be flashy. And but that's, you know, you're talking about two different cities, two different ways of doing business. You know, in New York, it was cool to be a wise guy. In Chicago, if if you were one, nobody needed to know you were one. People figured it out for themselves. Got it. So so when you guys saw what was going on with John Gotti and and he was out there and he was in the media and the public eye. Were you guys just like shaking your heads and saying, what's, what's this guy doing? Yeah, because I, you know, that wasn't the way here. So people, people did shake their heads. People did try to figure out why, you know, he was the way he was, but it worked for him. And, you know, it's again, and I respect it because I understand the life and I understand growing up that way and, and the respect and honor, but the, but the flashiness and stuff. No, that was, that was a no, no here. I mean, I, I, you know, I've seen guys, you know, uh, cars taken away from guys, people told kind of like in in uh, Goodfellas 
when when they you know you pick pull up in a fancy car that's how that's the kind of talk that was here somebody pull up in a fancy car what are you doing driving that car you better get rid of it you know no cadillacs no you know, everybody drove fords chevys you know that and that came down from the bosses you know it wasn't uh it wasn't a decision for for somebody to make it was made for them gotcha so so now walk us through with your father your brother yourself the dynamic i know your your you know your brother is very outspoken i i saw some stuff on youtube um and and what happened there like you guys were before jail before before everybody went away what what was it like well it's an unfortunate thing that i i no longer have a relationship with my brother um i said that i know it sounds like a cliche but i've said it he's dead to me um i've basically put in the position where I had to make a choice in my life to either let this stuff continue or, or tell people what really happened. Um, it's unfortunate. My brother and I don't have a relationship, uh, before we went to prison. Uh, we, we, we did, we had a, a relationship, but it always seemed that that relationship was built on one person. In other words, if I, I it was a one way street, that relationship. I, I, I did everything I could for my brother, just like I would, I did for my family. And you know, I put my family first, did everything I could for my family, including him, including his kids. You know, I, I, I did all that and I would do it over again. I just can't, uh, I can't let the lies and the, and the, you know, all the stuff that's going on, it, it affects me. It affects me every day. So I, I have to, you know, I have to do what I have to do now to, to survive, to, to get through, you know, what, what, what's going on with, with all the stuff. I mean, um, some years back, many, well, many years back, uh, he, he, uh, my brother talked to, and he talked about it in his book and he t- talked about it in all, in probably most of his interviews that, uh, about the money that he stole from my father. And, you know, the way it happened wasn't the way it was told. It had the way it was written in his book had wasn't true. Uh, I explained, uh, that, you know, he, 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 I was responsible for that money. My father had me putting a lot of money away in safety deposit boxes. Uh, he used to strap the money, tape the money to me in envelopes. And I would go to the safety deposit boxes and bring the, bring the money. And, um, you know, the, my father, my father, my father was a hard person to understand. Um, uh, I, I, we had a lot of heat on us at the time. Uh, we were being followed, uh, you know, constantly. I mean, you could see it for good reason too. Um, so I went to my father and told him, uh, I, I, I knew I was being followed and I, and I did not want to get pulled over with all this money on me. So I told him, my dad, I said, what, what do I, what do you want me to say if I get pulled over with this money? Because they're going to take the money. They're not going to care where it came from unless I can am, admit it that it's yours or that it's cash, you know, they, they, they're they going to know it and they're going to take it. And then, and, and, and I'm not going to say anything, but I have to say something. If you want to, if you want to keep the money, if you want them to not take it from me, I'm going to have to say something. And my father's answer to me was don't get pulled over. Come on. Classic. So at that, <laughs> That's tough. Yeah, at that point I knew if I didn't know before, at that point, I knew exactly what I meant to him. What was important to him was that money that I had yet. He still never gave me an answer. So at that point, I had to make a decision for myself. And I said, I'm not going back to the bank, I'm not going back to bring any more money into those banks. So I loaded up a hockey bag of, an, of the envelopes with the money in them. And I knew the, what kind of money was in there because I was actually helping my father stuff the envelopes. How much was it? Well, there was, there was about a million dollars in each box, each safety deposit box. So the two, I didn't, the last two, I didn't fill up. I put the money in the hockey bags. So there was, there was anywhere between a million and a half and $2 million in that hockey bag. Wow. I, I struggled being able to pick the bag up. That's how heavy it was. I had to, actually had to drag the bag out of my room and brought it into the garage, a garage that was attached to our house that had, uh, it was an alarm system and everything. The house, the, the garage was secure. And I put it up there and I made one mistake mistake. I, I told my brother where that was thinking I could trust him, thinking that he understood how serious this was, knowing my father, knowing how he was with his money, knowing, you know, the risk that he, he would put me and himself in by taking it. And he went ahead and took it. And I didn't, I don't know how long he had it before I went and checked, 
but I went and checked and it was gone. Um, and, and, and I went to him and I asked him, did you touch the money? And he swore on his kids to me that he didn't. And which is hard for me to, somebody swearing on their kids is sacred to me. You know, that, I mean, there's no, there's nothing beyond that is I swear on my kids' lives. So I, I kept that secret from my father to a point to where he eventually said, Hey, we, we got to go get that money out of the, out of the banks. I think he kind of knew at that point what was going on. And we went and went down to my brother's house, woke him up, got pulled him out of the house at five in the morning. And, uh, from there, my, you know, he, he swore up and down again that he didn't take it. And then my father gave him a crack and he felt he went down and then he admitted it. He said, I, I took the money and, uh, kind of guy my father was with me he stopped right there and then and he looked at me and he said see I told you he took it and you were defending him he told me and all I said was I wasn't defending him I was telling you he swore to me that he didn't take it and to the and to my father that was me defending my brother but I but I you know I should have came clean when I found out the money was gone I should have told my father uh, I was very scared for my life at that point uh, you know it's funny because you hear people like Junior talk about my dad and, you know, boy, what a serious man he was and all this and stuff. But but yet you took you took the thing that meant most to him, his money, and you just stole it from him and knew that at some point it was going to be it was going to come out. So where where's the fear? I mean, you you talk about fear at one out of one side of your mouth then you talk about what a great guy he was. And but what about when he when, when the money was gone and I was hiding and I was scared for my life and, you know. I was just going to ask. Why do you think, Kurt, your dad had this love for money? And was it just the power that it came with? Um, what was, what was, uh, why was he the way he was? You know what? We, we've talked about that amongst family members, amongst friends for years and years. And, and nobody seems to be able to, you know, pinpoint why he became that way. We, there's a certain point in his life that, People that were around him then, like my mother or like other, you know, people that were around said they noticed a change in my dad when he started getting more power. And so, you know, that's probably the only thing that we can come up with. But, uh, you know, he I, 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 I don't have there's not a lot of nice things I can say about my father other than he was my father and I loved him. But as far as a, a dad, as far as a, a human being, you know, I, I in Chicago, it was always not, you don't bring your kids into, into that life in Chicago. New York, it's a little bit different. In fact, Michael and I had that conversation on his show, um, the differences. And, uh, you know, you just didn't do it. And a lot of people here in Chicago didn't know to what level my father brought us into it until the case started, until the Family Secrets case started. Because that's what the name of the case was, Family Secrets. They were talking about about our family and there were four of us involved in that world and for well i wasn't involved in, the, in that case but i was brought into that case i wasn't indicted i wasn't but i was played with i, I was used as a pawn in that in that trial i had the government threatening to put me up on the stand and then we got we got past that and then my father subpoenas me to put me up on the stand so it was i was trying to do everything i could to stay away from it and that my father's doing everything in his power to drag me back into getting the middle of, of this case. I, I don't know if you guys are aware of it, but I've, my, you know, I've, I had had threats uh, going back to before the trial started when I was still living in Elmwood park, I had rats put on my doorstep. They had little white nooses around their necks. Like they were supposed to be hung and they were put, put on They're two white rats that were put on my doorstep. Uh, that was something I've seen done before. So I kind of knew what it was meant, how it was meant. The only thing was the rats were supposed to be dead. So whoever brought them did, couldn't kill them. And so that was the first threat I had gotten. And a letter in my mailbox quoting, uh, quoting the Bible and quoting uh, relationships between sons and fathers. So uh, who, was who was threatening you? Did, you? did you ever find out? No. No, I, 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 that, and again, the, they came in, in phases. So that was the first phase. I, 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 I know my father, it, it had to do with my father that he was behind it. I just didn't, you know, I wasn't a thousand percent sure, but you know, 
I'm not hundred percent sure, but I was 99% sure. Like I said, the things that were done were things that I've seen done. So I, I got the message. I, I knew what the message was and I got it. The only problem is, is like with the rats putting on, put on my doorstep, I, my family was being threatened and I had nothing to do with the case. I wasn't, I didn't cooperate. I wouldn't talk to anybody. So it was a little odd to people to why I was being bothered when I had nothing to do with the case, but you know, that's my dad. That was my dad. That's how he was. If he, if he thought something needed to be done, he didn't care. He did it. So I, you know, those threats were, I believe were coming from him. All the threats I believe were coming from him, but I just don't know why. So, so I say this with the utmost respect and to you, to your family, are you saying that your father would have potentially killed you if he thought you were snitching or found out you snitched? Uh, uh, that's a hard question to answer because uh, there's days that I, I believe that and there's days that I don't believe that he would on that. Uh, the way it all played out was, listen, let me, let me say this. If my father wanted me dead, I would have been dead. If my father wanted my brother dead, he would have been dead. You know, this that's reality of, of what, when you speak the truth. I, I can't hide and say, well, uh, you know, I could I could have outfought my dad or I could have protected myself. If he what he was very good at what he did. So if he wanted you dead, you were going to be dead. So all this talk about, oh, well, he pulled a gun on me and he did this. My father pulled a gun out on anybody. He'd have killed them. I learned that as a young kid that my father lived by that rule. If somebody pulls a gun on you, you have to kill him. So, you know, the, the talk, the, 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 oh, well, you know, he did this, he did that. My father wanted us dead, we'd have been dead. That's reality. So if he, the, the threats I, I got, like I said, they were, they were, the threats didn't scare me. The fact that where they were being brought to did because somebody was following me. They were putting uh, notes on my car after I had moved out of Elmwood Park, there people, whoever was following me had put in threatening letters on my car. And again, I was, you know, they, they had to be following me to, to, to know where I was. So that, that bothered me a little bit, but you know, once, once you become accustomed to it and know, like I said, with the mentality of, I can't hide. If he wants me dead, he's I'm going to I'm going to be dead. So that's a, that's a hard pill to swallow, you know? Especially when you're not doing anything wrong, you're not cooperating. You're not. You won't talk to nobody. You, you, right. you know. I mean, his, his anger for me must have had a lot to do with the fact that I walked away from him and walked away from that life. Right. And he wasn't happy about that. Yeah. So, what was? Did you ever? Obviously, there was a lot of things that happened in that life, experiences, stories that I'm sure you could share. What was one thing that you saw your father do? That you were just like, I can't believe this guy just did this. I, I know what he's all about, but I can't believe he just did this. Are you able to share something like that with us? Yeah. Uh, one story that pops into my head, <clears throat> and, I don't, and I've never really talk, told this story, but um, my father had taken over a, a, some uh, adult bookstores in Chicago. Um, the he had gotten close to some the, the guy that ran them and, and little by little, they ended up pushing the guy out. Actually, the guy ended up packing up and running away to disappear because he was afraid of my dad. But um, I saw my dad treat this man and we saw, we used to see this man because we went to these stores. We used to empty the coins out and we used to, you know, that, that was part of our, our route that we worked. And the guy, you know, I, the guy was a nice guy. I mean, and again, I didn't know him outside of seeing him, but he was always nice to us. And he seemed like a nice guy. I saw my dad just, you know, give this guy a hard time and, you know, uh, yell at him and scream at him. My father liked, liked to raise his voice to people. And, you know, with the outcomes, it was usually a crack or something. But he, he the way he talked to this guy, and, and, and again, I, I, you know, I, I didn't particularly appreciate and having to be there and watch it. And my father didn't care. He, if he, when he was going to do what he was going to do, he was, he didn't care who was around or say what he was going to say. He didn't care. But we, I, again, I was, I was probably 15 years old, 14, 15 years old and watching one grown man yell at another grown man like that. And, and you know, at any time libel to put his hands on him or throw, he was throwing stuff in there. And you know, that, that kind of stuck with me because we had to go see, we had to go see this guy every week. 
We had to go, you know, empty these machines and spend time at his business. And it just, I don't know, it just bothered me that, you know, that he treated that man that way. But again, I, I didn't know everything. So maybe, maybe I missed something. Maybe I didn't see something that happened. But that's how my dad was with everybody. I mean, he, he you know, he, when he lost it or he got his, he, his temper, you know, he, he had a very short temper. And once that temper was gone and once he lost it, he didn't really care who was around or who saw whatever. I mean. Got it. I actually just wanted to, uh, on that point, Kurt, just talk to you a little bit about how that would work when it came to businesses. What would uh, be the deciding factor that your dad would see in a certain business and be like, that's the business I want to get involved in or I want to kind of be a part of? What was the the main factor that kind of drove him, you think? Whatever made money. If it makes money, it makes if sense. it makes money, it makes sense. <laughs> there was a gentleman who, and again, it's hard for me to, I got to go back to, to set up the story, but to make a long story short, there was a, a, a guy that uh, had a auto body shop, a car mechanic auto body shop in our neighborhood. And I had known him because I met him through a friend that I was, I stood up for a wedding and he was at the wedding. This gentleman's name was Matt, Matt. <laughs> he, uh, he had the sh- shop and and it was my father was into cars my father loved old cars my father was that was a hobby of his a love of his and so uh my dad came to the wedding to see me and so i introduced the guy to him at the wedding and they became friends and and my father started going to the guy's shop uh started bringing cars there and the guy knew who my dad was and he liked you know he wanted to get close to my dad and or just hang around him and so he uh we started hanging out there, bringing cars there. And my father was meeting some people there. And uh, anyhow, he got this Matt got himself in trouble. Uh, he was uh, uh, he was doing drugs and he was just he got himself in a whole lot of trouble. But but he had a million dollar a year business. And when my father heard again, and my father wasn't an educated man. But my father heard this guy's making a million dollars a year right away. He thought, well, this guy's bringing home a million dollars a year. No, there's a million dollars of business going through there. So my father wanted to get in this guy's business. So he played, kind of played hero to him. The guy was in, uh, guy's family was ready to leave him. He had three mortgages on his house. They were going to take his house. So my father said, well, here, we'll, we'll, we, at the time we were doing, we were rehabbing houses and we were doing, you know, some, uh, real estate stuff. So that's what my father wanted to do with legitimize the money. And he wanted to put it into real estate. So we, uh, he, we bought his house, this guy's house. And, uh, and my, and the deal my father made with him was he, this guy was going to pay, uh, pay rent to live in the house. And at some point when he gets on his feet, he can buy the house back. So that was what the deal that was made. Uh, I didn't particularly like the guy. Um, I didn't get along with him. I, 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 I knew what he was about. I knew he was, you know, and I even told my father, I said, dad, you know, that this guy's not a good guy. He's, he's doing things that you wouldn't be very happy about. Well, my father didn't hear that part. All he saw was dollars, dollars, dollars. All he saw was an opportunity for him to, you know, to make money. So, uh, so what ended up happening was the FBI set this guy up, Matt, uh, found this guy, Matt was telling everybody now that we were hanging there at the shop, that he was part of our crew, part of my father's crew. And so the FBI got wind of it and they sent somebody in there. They sent a, a, a guy, a, an agent in there to drive a tow truck. And it's funny because, you know, I, I, I when I talk about my dad, I, I always mention how good he was at his job. And my father was, was very sharp when it came to being on the street. And so he, there were, there were on tape, this guy was wearing a wire on us now. And on tape, you hear my father telling this, this guy, who is this guy, this tow truck driver work for you? And he said, well, yeah, he's a tow truck driver. And he said, well, he's got a beeper number on the side of his car, side of his truck. What kind of tow truck driver has a beeper number on the side of their truck? In other words, you, you got to beep the tow truck driver and he's going to pull over and call you back. So to the point my father was making to him was he told him, I hope you're not doing anything wrong with this guy because he's probably an FBI agent. 
Well, that's because my father didn't believe anybody was doing anything wrong there. And technically, nobody was doing anything wrong there. But the, the lies that they caught him in, I mean, he told them he was working for my father. He told him he was giving out juice loans, told him he was uh, in the mob. He, uh, you no, know, a bunch of stuff. And oh, that he met Frank Sinatra at our house in Wisconsin. You know, it was just a, a lie after lie after lie. And the government was believing this. And so they tried to build a case on this and they ended up taking the house away from us that we owned, that we bought legitimately. That was part of, and that was another thing I did for my father. Uh, any legitimate businesses that, that, that we put any money into or tried to start up, I was always responsible for. I always had to take care of that on top of taking care of anything else for him on top of taking care of my life and my family. So that, you know, kind of bouncing around here a little bit, but, um, but he, my father liked that guy, Matt, he liked him. He felt sorry for him. And that was probably cost my father, his, his life, his life of freedom because, because of that case that, that just snowballed into other stuff. And, uh, but they never, ever, never able to really use this guy's testimony against us because most of it was lies. And, and it was outrageous lies. It wasn't even, you know, it was stuff that people would, you know, people were making up just because they wanted to say they were part of their life. But to answer your question, I'm sorry, I went off the beaten path, but what the businesses my father liked were businesses that made money. If he saw you making money, he wanted to get in your business, in your pocket. And it's still true today. If it makes money, it makes sense. That's, that's what people, how people look at it. But um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about that. So, what was the the reason why your brother and your father first went to prison? What was the reason that they, they got caught? And then how did that change into the big court case that everybody knew about and, you know, led to, to greater consequences for them in prison? How, how did that, how did they get caught? What did they get caught for? Well, our case that we were involved in, was my whole was my my brother my father my uncle and myself and and other guys also but um that was that was with that gentleman Matt that I was talking about that that first case that's how that all got started and so from there uh, they took the house that uh, this men, gentleman lived in Matt they ended up taking that uh, taking the house seizing it. And at the time we were trying to sell the house because the guy that we knew he disappeared went probably went into the witness protection program. So we, I was trying to sell the house for my dad. He wanted, he wanted the house gone. Well, once the government got wind of it, they came in and they, they seized the house and they made us prove to them that we bought the house legitimately, which, which I basically did. Uh, but that didn't stop the case from going forward. And what ended up happening was, uh, it, it, the government offered plea deals to my uncle, to my father, to my brother, and they all accepted them. But the problem was I wasn't going to take a deal. I was, I was going to fight the case because I knew in court I would win. Uh, I, in the civil case, that was the first case this, with the house, we basically beat them. And it ended up playing out that we didn't beat them, but, but we, if we would have followed through with it, we probably would have beat it in court. Problem is my father didn't want to risk the money from the house. He wanted to make the government offered to make a deal. We made a deal, but the plea, I was offered a plea. And when I took, when I refused it, they came back and said, well, if Kurt doesn't take a plea, then we don't give his father, his brother and his uncle their pleas. So now it was put on me to take the plea for everyone. Or if I say no, everyone goes to trial, including me. And in the trial with everybody there, you know, everybody together, I'm going to be found guilty. But if I'm in a trial by myself at that house, I win. So I never thought twice about it. Uh, I took the, I took the plea. Uh, it, it was, you know, it, it was weird the way it all played out because uh, I, I'm not, I, I think my lawyer, kind of sold me out on that. But uh, my father didn't know. I went to him and told him that I was that I took the plea because uh, he had said, "If son, if you don't take this plea, I'm going to die in prison. I said, I, it's already done. It's already signed. I took it was two years. Um, but, you know, that's how that's how that case ended up. And then they came and they indicted us. 
no, they indicted us for that. And then, and then that we went away, came home, and that's when the family secrets case started. So, and so just, just if we just I, interject there, can I interject there? So, did everybody get a two-year plea deal? Everybody, your uncle, your brother, yourself. No, they were all depending on what you were charged with. My dad got pled out. My dad pled out to ten and a half years. My uncle pled out to, I think, close to six. And I think my brother, thirty-seven months or something like that. So everybody's was different based on their charges. And my charge technically was only conspiracy, conspiracy to, to defraud the IRS. That was my, my, uh, my plea. So, so everybody got different times, but, but they, it all hinged on my plea. What was it at this time where your brother's in prison and, and either he reaches out to the FBI or the FBI reaches out to him? Well, how that took place was uh, I drove, my brother got locked up first because in one of the uh, hearings, he had to take drug tests and I guess he, he, his drug test came up bad. So they, they locked him up right out of the courtroom. I wasn't even in town. I was out of town when that happened. Uh, so he was already locked up and they were going to keep him until, until, you know, until we started our time. And he, uh, so what, what, when, my father got, when it was time that he, my dad was able to self-surrender, which so also I was, and so was my uncle. We were able to self-surrender. So when my father surrendered, I drove him to prison. My brother was already there at the prison in, in Michigan, Milan, Michigan. And when I drove my father there, I had, hadn't been speaking to my father at the time, but he decided that, you know, I, I was leaving to go away. I, I wanted to see him. I, I, I wanted to be part of him going, you know, I just, I was hoping there was part of me that hoped that day when I drove him, that I would get some closure that I would, we'd have a conversation. It was a three, three and a half hour ride. It was plenty of time to talk that we would work some things out and, you know, I would feel better about everything. And I mean, again, cause I was leaving uh, less than a month later to turn myself into prison. So my, my father got out of the car. He said, the reason they're putting me here with your brother is because they're going to try to get him to cooperate against me. Uh, that's how my father felt. That's what my father said. Uh, how it ended up playing out doesn't make any sense to me because of what he told me. Told me, and he always told stressed that he didn't trust my brother. Don't trust your brother. Don't try. And it goes back to the money. He said, and see, he screwed you then. Don't trust him. So I didn't know what was going on when I was away. Uh, I was having a lot of problems. Uh, I was being bothered by the administration a lot when I was away. I couldn't figure out why. And I started to, when I found out or got rumors that my brother was cooperating, then I started to think, okay, well, maybe that's why they're bothering me. They're trying to get me to cooperate, um, which nobody ever approached me about doing. And I wouldn't have done it ever. Um, I would have rather have died than, than, done, than have done that. But that's me. That's how I feel. Uh, and then he came home. My brother came home after, after, after I let him out and told me what he did. Uh, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it because I didn't believe what my brother was saying. My father actually said on tape, well, actually said, let alone said on tape. Because my father never talked to anybody about anything and talk about murders and talk about, you know, and when he did, it was in code. And, and I said the same thing to Michael because my father had the same mentality that once something happened and it was done, you never talk about it again. If you bring it up, I, I'm going to, you know, I'm going gonna, I, 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 to tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. So, and, and drove everybody crazy how, how careful he was about things to the point to where it, it did drove, drive you crazy, but, but you learn to be careful. So there was a, you know, there was a side of that, that helped you in life, you know, learning that way. But so I went, when my brother came home and told me that I didn't believe it. So that was one of the reasons why I went to the trial every day because I wanted to hear you know, you, if you read the newspaper or you watch the news, you get a piece of what's going on. If you're there in a the courtroom, you hear everything. So that's why I ended up on the court during the trial. And that didn't work out well for me either, because the first day I was in their trial, my father's lawyer pointed me out. And nobody knew who I was in the courtroom until that happened. And then all of a sudden, every day I was getting hounded by reporters and hounded by people that were there and the courtroom was full every day with spectators or whatever you want to call them, not spectators, but audience. So you, when we first spoke, you and I, you said, you know, you, you said, I, I've never 
ratted. I've never snitched. And, you know, you don't pass judgment on anybody who's done what they have, they've had to do. Um, but why was that? Like, why did you, why did you say to yourself, I'm never going to do this. It's not who I am. And like, what, what was that conversation like with yourself? It, it was, it, it wasn't a conversation. It was more of a, a way of living, a way of thinking, you know, the, and, and, and again, I still think that way. And, and, and I didn't make a choice to be brought into this life. But but I I I lived up to my expectations. I did what I was asked to do. I remained loyal. Uh, I I I I don't I I didn't know how not to do that. And that's where you know if if somebody said, well, would you do it all over again? Would I, you know I, I I would be loyal again. And then I am loyal, and I will remain loyal till I die. But I but I I wouldn't give I wouldn't let people treat me or, or take advantage of me the way that they did. You know, I was taken advantage of by my, my, my father. I was taken advantage by my brother. And, and you know, I, uh, that's family or that was family. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily think my way of thinking was right, but it was just a way of life. And, you know, I, I respect it. I, I, I do. I respect people that, that live their lives and, you know, did things. And, and again, I don't judge don't judge anybody. Um, I have just had different ways of thinking. You know, I don't, I'm not judging my brother either by what he's doing. I don't like it. And I, and I, and it's, and he's lying about a lot of things and that bothers me. But again, it's, you know, that's his choice. You know, my uncle was very loyal. My uncle was a very loyal man and he preached that too. And I had a, you know, my uncle was like a father to me and you, you wouldn't find a more loyal person than my, than my uncle. And even though I don't necessarily agree with what my brother did or with my uncle did, but my brother was, my brother reached out to cause that, to provoke that. My uncle was put in a position where he really wasn't given much of a choice. So when people talk about that, oh, well, your brother and your uncle, your brother and your uncle, you know, my uncle, my uncle offered to take my time and my brother's time when we pled out, my uncle offered and said, Hey, I'll take both of my nephew's time. And my father did, my father did not do that. In fact, uh, real quick. So, you know, how, how the government works, uh, when we got arrested, the day we got arrested, we were put in, my father was put in a room. And my brother and I were put in a room right across the hallway with the doors open. And my father was asked, and I'll never forget this. My father was asked by the government, are told by the government, listen, Frank, um, you you accept responsibility for what you've done and we'll let your kids go. We'll let them go right now. And we heard this whole conversation. It was staged. We were supposed to hear it. And the sad thing is, is when I heard that, him say that, he, my father said, I'm not worried about my kids. They're both men. And at that time, I had thought I got the highest compliment ever from my father that he finally recognized me for being a man. And I walked out of that day with my chest out saying, oh, I finally earned the respect of my father. When in all actuality, what kind of man is offered that kind of deal and, and, and doesn't take it? You're, we're gonna let your kids go, we'll let them walk out right now. And it wasn't, they didn't ask him to cooperate. They knew he wasn't gonna cooperate with them. All they said to him was accept responsibility, we'll work it out and we'll let your kids go. And when the, he didn't do that, that's when the government said, you know what? Because I, I think that was a that the government was trying to be reasonable with with him because they really didn't need us, me and my brother. They really didn't. Not for the case. But I think that they thought by doing that, they would use that as leverage to get my father so they wouldn't have to fight my dad. They would just get him to accept responsibility. No trial. And, but he uh, yeah, my uncle said to them, I'll take my nephews, both of my nephews time. So that that's the kind of guy my uncle was. And and I believe that. And, and, and also my mother's a loyal person. You know, I, I, I feel like I got my loyalty from my mother. My mother was loyal and still is to, to her whole family. And, you know, my father wasn't, wasn't very nice. Wasn't very good with my mother. But my mother won't say a bad word about my dad. And that's that to me, that's the person that she is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to ask you, because 
we I didn't hear this on our, our friend Michael Francis's interview with you, but I, I got to ask you, what was one of the most gruesome or horrific things that you fit, you had to do, which now you know you you've very openly spoken about your PTSD and how it impacts your your everyday life. What was one of those things, those moments that's you know you did and and you said, you know, this is gonna stay with me the rest of my life. Well, I've seen therapists and um, heard their opinions and stuff and, and why they think certain things happen. And, and um, the, 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 post, the type of post-traumatic stress disorder that I have is called complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's kind of hard for me to explain, but um, it's a, it, the, it, it was the reason that the therapist thought I had that at first and, and agreed later on is that um, the, the, the physical abuse the verbal abuse. Uh, my father was was hands on. My father beat me um, regularly for for something as stupid as moving a cup on a table or putting some here, and he wanted it there. Uh, he had a, he, he had a raging temper, uh, and and that was a, a regular day for me. Was dealing with that with my father. Sometimes dealing with him two, three, four times a day, and you know he he was. You know, he was very abusive, very abusive. And and the verbal stuff, the, the physical stuff goes away. You know, the bumps, they heal, the, the bruises heal. But the verbal stuff that you heard every day, you know, that, that keeps reliving in, in my mind. That, you know, I, I hear him in my mind every day. The names being called and, you know, and just the words he used. And and so I, that that's what the doctors, the therapists, and and, you know, believe that that's where that came from. And, you know, and again, I, I, as a kid, I used to cry myself to sleep at night and wish for death. And I'm talking about when I was seven, eight, nine years old, every night I would go to bed and I would hope that I wouldn't wake up. And, you know, that's not something that I, I, I brag about or something that I, I, you know, it's hard for me to discuss that because it was so real every day. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's a struggle. It's a fight every day. And, uh, you know, and some days I feel like I'm doing great. Some days I don't feel like I'm doing so good. And, uh, and I can't change everything that's happened. It's, and part of this, I tell my story and part of this getting out there is something that can help me. It's probably the only thing that, that I know of that can help me is, is coming to grips with what life was about coming to grips with, you know, what I dealt with and, and trying to move on. And I've got three kids, two grandkids, uh, they're my life. My mother's my life. My bro my younger brother's my life. Yeah, I've got some great friends that are that have been there for me. I, I don't know what I would have done without my friends, especially when I went to prison. Because when I went to prison, I didn't get any help from from either one of my families. Now, I, I, my my ex wife, her grandfather was my father's boss. He was he was part of the Angelo Lapitra. He was part of the uh, the casino movie. He was he was one of the bosses in Vegas for for the for that movie. When I was gone, uh, you know, my father didn't help my family. Uh, my aunt, my wife's grandfather, they didn't help our family. I had friends that were there for me, and but it's just you know it's it's stereotypical that in that world you know you're supposed to be taken care of. You're you know. I, and and this was family. This wasn't even just that world. This was family. These were people that claimed to be family. My father, uh, her grandfather, you know, they claimed to be our family. Yet they didn't care if my kids had food on the table, if they had gifts at Christmas. They didn't care. And that just goes to show you how hypocritical that that life is in that world. You know, the 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 the, the loyalty. Where's the where's that loyalty? I, I guess I wasn't entitled to that loyalty or entitled to that, you know, that that perk of taking care of my family. And that again, that would that came into played into me walking away from that life, because once I saw what it was about and again, it, it's family, it's part of life, that life. But yet these are family members. You know, if these are strangers that I worked for, you know, it'd be OK, I, you know. Life is life. Is it right to take care of these people? Yeah. But if they don't, what are you going to do about it? But this was family. This was my father. This was her grandfather. These were families that were very well off and didn't care if didn't care if I had a roof over my head. They didn't care. 
And again, that's that that I, I'm glad that that happened, and I was glad that I could see it because I I dealt with it accordingly. It's just you know it's hypocritical. It's you know that life, the loyalty, the, the where's the loyalty at? Where's the where's the honor at? Well, I, I, you know, I, I've watched people's families get taken care of, and so and I was part of that, but yet they were they weren't family. They were just worker guys that worked for my dad. But, you know, family, I paid my brother's lawyer bill because my father wouldn't pay it. You know, and that was after my brother stole the money and didn't have any money left. I, I paid his lawyer bill. So, I, you know, I, I was I was a family person. I was a loyal person my whole life. I, I do anything for my family. I did anything for my family. I just wanted to, on that note, Kurt, ask, so they didn't really help or take care necessarily of your family while you're on the inside. Did at least the, um, the reputation that your father had, um, help you on the inside in prison? Did, were people scared of you? Were people, uh, did you have a, a target on your back, uh, because of the reputation your family had and your father had, or was it of some help at least, uh, when you're in prison? That's a great question, Dan. Um, what prison, prison was for me, I had self-surrendered to a camp in Oxford, Wisconsin. And if you, if you heard of Club Fed, that it was a, it was a camp and it was a Club Fed. Uh, it was a nice place to be. I mean, it was still prison, but it was a nice place to be. Uh, there were no uh, fences, bars. There were no, you know, you could walk right off the campgrounds and nobody would, you know, and nobody would see you and wouldn't make a difference. I mean, you'd get in trouble if you got caught, but... And so I did, I did seven months there and then I got shipped out of there and I got shipped downtown to the MCC in downtown Chicago. I went from a camp that's laid back where nobody bothers anybody. It's just people doing their time to a place that's really considered a maximum security prison, the MCC. So from that, things had changed. And uh, first of all, being Italian in prison, you looked at, you were looked at a little differently. You weren't looked at as really white. You were looked at as Italian. Um, but, it, but at the time I was away, things were changing quickly and there weren't a lot of Italians where I were was there weren't a lot, a lot of Italians. There were a handful. And so I, I didn't, I, I had a, it worked for me in some ways. It worked against me in some ways. It worked for me because I was Italian and people knew a little bit of, you know, the background of our, my family. So that, that, but there were also a lot of young guys there, young gangbanger guys who were trying to make a name for themselves. So, you know, if, and I had, you know, I had a few problems, nothing major, but I had a few problems. And uh, so I, if that answers your question, it was, it was both, it helped in some ways, it hurt in some ways. Did you ever have to, yeah, did you ever have to fight off somebody in prison? Like, did somebody ever try to take your life and try to defend yourself? Or or is that just in the movies? Or did that actually happen? Or I only had one situation that came to that, and it kind of got resolved pretty quickly. But it could have gotten ugly. And again, it was with a young, a young guy who was a gangbanger who was trying to make a name for himself. And you know, I was... I was in a kitchen working. I was, I was only one of very few white people at that. And uh, so I was kind of singled out by these guys, this kid. And uh, it all worked out, but it, it, uh, it could have gotten ugly, uglier than it did, but it all worked out. And I, most of the guards I didn't have problems with when I was away. I, I had more problems with the administration because, like I said, now I look back and think, okay, now it made sense to me why they were treating me the way they were treating me because – it was around the same time that my brother was cooperating. So I got shipped. I got, you know, I had, I, and I, and to be honest with you, I went in to prison with the chip on my shoulder. Um, I, I didn't, I shouldn't say I went into prison with it. When I got there, my first experience walking into the camp was I got whistled into the warden's office. And like I said, I just gotten there and self-surrendered. So I, I didn't do anything. And I got brought into this man's office and he sat behind his desk told me to sit down and they immediately started yelling at me and banging the desk. And what I saw was my dad. When, when he started doing that, I saw my dad and I thought, okay, here I'm here. I put up with this my whole life here. I'm now in prison. I'm in prison. 
But you can't send me anywhere place worse than you could send me in prison. The only other place is the hole in prison, which I was in too. So, uh, you know, if this is the worst that you can do to me, I'm, I'm not taking this anymore. I'm not going to sit there and have you scream and yell at me unless I did something wrong. If I did something wrong, tell me. I'll accept responsibility. But the guy told me when I went there, I don't like you. I don't like your kind. And I'm going to get you shipped out of here. I don't know what he meant by my kind, but he got me shipped out of there. Exactly what he said he was going to do. He got me shipped out of there. And, and you know, it went, like I said, I went from a very laid back setting to now a, a, a maximum security setting overnight. And within a five hour uh, bus ride. I'd, so. Wow. wow. That's uh that's pretty, pretty intense. And I, I want to, I want to kind of just talk one last point about your brother. Uh, we're obviously brothers. We get into arguments all the time. Nothing, nothing of, of this nature, but if he's listening, if he's watching this, will you give him the opportunity to come together, sit down and make amends? What I've told people is I would love for that to happen, but in order for that to ever happen, my brother has to come clean with the lies that he's told. When, if he, if he'll do that, then I will sit down and talk to him. As of right now, I don't think that's ever going to happen. Um, in fact, the lies just keep piling up and piling up and piling up and they have to, the lies have to be addressed because like I said, I, my life, my brother's life and my life were not the same. Okay. What I lived every day, he didn't live. What I had to do every day, he didn't have to do. Uh, my father kicked him to the curb at some point and, and, and he was able to do that because my uncle and I picked up the, the, the slack for what my brother was doing. So, um, I'm, I'm, it's not a contest to me. It's not of who I, I've always told my brother, if you're going to tell the story, tell the truth. The truth is a lot more interesting than, than the lies. And then the, 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 you know, and it is a lot of people that I've spoken to have told me that. And, you know, again, I, I, I've, I've got to come clean with this stuff. It's, it's, it's weighing me down and it's sucking out of the life out of me. And it has been for a long time. And you know, I love my brother. I always love him. I, but I can't recognize him as a brother because in my eyes, I'm a brother. And if you're going to be a brother, you got to be the same person that I am, or you have to have the same values, at least, you know, I love my niece and my nephew. I love them. And, 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 and I was always part of their life and, and I'm hope to be always be a part of their life. But, you know, I, there's a lot, a lot of things that my brother's done that it's just, you know, it's hard for me to, to look past anymore. I've, I've done it for 60 years and look where it's gotten me. So, you know, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but you know, I'm, I'm, I've always forgiven people. The only person I I've never forgiven is my father because of, you know, the way everything played out. I, I, uh, you know, he, he chose to do what he did and I chose to do what I did. Part of a uh, part of forgiveness that I've gone through for myself with with others is not only to forgive them for their actions and off to make a peace between you know two people or parties, but also for yourself for your own for your own healing and your own stuff, right? So, yeah, we'll 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 work on that. We'll we'll pray and on I'm that for you. I'm learning more. Yeah, I'm learning more about that about you know forgiving for myself, but it's it's. You know, what people understand is I'm 61 years old and in 61 years it, to try to fix 61 years is going to take 61 years. <laughs> so I'm learning to, to try to forgive or let things go because it's, it hurts me, you know, but, but it's a hard, that's a hard thing to learn, you know, in, in the life that I had, it's a, it's a hard thing to learn. How did you come across our friend, Michael Francis? How did that, did you guys ever have dealings together or was that more recent? No, it, it's more recent. Um, I had a friend reach out to him and see if he was interested in talking. Uh, he he responded. And uh, the only thing we that I wanted from him was be able to do it face to face. I'm, I'm more comfortable talking people face to face. Um, I'm very old school, old fashioned. Uh, I, I don't like talking on phones. I this the Zoom stuff is all new to me. Uh, but 
so I, I, we, we, he, my friend reached out to him. Uh, we agreed to do the show face to face and we had to, we had to change it a few times because he's a very busy man, very busy man. But I would have not done that interview with anyone else, but Michael and reason being is, and, and again, if you see the interview, you'll hear, hear it out of Michael's mouth, but, uh, the similarities in our lives were, were amazing. And it, when you're talking to somebody that can relate to you, there's not too many people are going to be able to relate to my story. You know what I lived and I'm not comparing what I lived to what Michael lived. Cause Michael was, you know, Michael was on a huge level, but you talk about a, a, a gentleman and a man who shakes your hand and, and, and does everything that he says he's going to do. I, I have the utmost respect for Michael. And, uh, and, and when I talk, when I sat and talked to him, I just felt like, you know, I, I felt so comfortable that, you know, I was so uptight doing it, but I felt so comfortable when I got done and, and kind of like you guys, that the setting is, is comfortable. You know, I, I, a lot of these podcasts and a lot of these shows, you know, I, I, I can't do because the, the, the things and the subject matter these guys want to talk about, you know, I, I'm honest with people. Just like I've, I've been honest with uh, with people I've dealt with, you know, I've walked away from deals, Hollywood deals, because I won't put my name on something that that isn't true. And I've had people offer me big money and I've had, I mean, people in the business that are, you know, well-known names. And uh, at the end of the day, I, I shake their hand and say, OK, this is what we're going to do. And once I see that that's not what we're going to do, then I walk away because I'm not going to I'm not going to sell myself out. I'm not going to sell myself short. Uh, I've walked away from deals just because the, the, the story they want to tell is not my story. But I've been honest with them and told them, I'll tell you who you can call that will be more than happy to, you know, as long as you pay them, they'll tell you anything you want to say. You know, that, that's how that's how uh, my brother ended up meeting the guys that wrote his book because they approached me first. And I told him, I said, what you guys want to do, it, it, you don't want me. You don't need me. You don't want me. You want to do a history of Chicago mob? That's fine. I'm not your guy. If you want to tell a story about about this or about that, I'm not your guy. If you want to tell our, my story, my family story, I'm I'm your guy. But if you want to tell this gangster shoot 'em up bullshit story, I'm, I'm I I don't want to be part of it. So I turned a few people on to my brother and said, "Hey, call him. He'll tell you whatever you want to tell you as long as you pay him." I respect that. Yeah, absolutely. And what about um, we had John Elite on the show a few weeks ago and. We, we felt like gentlemen, class act. He kept it real with us. That's why we have Second Chance here. Like that's a program he advocates for. Uh, and we promote like second, third, fourth, fifth chances. Uh, any dealings with him? Any run-ins in, in, with him or anything like that? No, no. I, I heard, heard his name uh, from people. Uh, not until later on in life um, when he came home from prison. But uh I had some friends out in New York. Uh, I still talk to occasionally that were part of their life. And, um, you know, again, like it's, it's funny cause it's New York. So, you know, what faction are you, who are you for, who are you against? You know, who do you like? Who don't you like? You know, they, they get into that stuff and, you know, I don't know a whole lot about his life. Um, but from what I understand it's very interesting and he seems like a, you know, like a pretty stand up guy, but again, they, their world was different. And, uh, and I'm glad it, what's really nice to see is that that second chance, that's his, that's his organization. No, it, I think it belongs to somebody else, but he's a, he's a very okay. strong advocate for it. Yeah. Okay. Cause I'm, I'm working with some people and, and, and one thing I wanted to do when I came home from prison, I reached out to uh, an organization called prevent child abuse and thought that I could help work with, I mean, and work with, actually do work with people, not, not, you know, I don't want to be on your board of directors. Or I just want to work with kids and be able to help kids. Well, they wouldn't even talk to me. They wouldn't even return my phone call because they found the, my background and, and that bothered me because the, these kids need help or, or people need help. And, and, you know, nobody, where's the hands on, you know, it's a big organization. You guys raise a lot of money, but where does that money go? And where, where's the hands on? So I, I, since that time, I've been talking to people about trying to start an organization where it's hands on. You know, I, I don't know what I can do to help. I think there's a lot I can do to help. But uh, on the bullying and the abuse side of it, 
you know, that's, that's something that, that from my heart, I want to be able to do and seeing John with second chance, I sounds like a nice organization. And that's, you know, you, you got to help kids, kids need help, you know, guidance, they need guidance, they need help. And you know, that the world that we live in right now is crazy. And you know, the, the, the gang issues and all this stuff that's going on is getting worse. You know, and, and I, I would just, I hope I can help somebody. I really do. I, that's my whole point of doing this is to be able, and, and I'm not going to, I'm going to be selfish in a way to say that that help would help me, me being able to help someone else would help me. And that's, that's how I've always felt, but I've never had the, the, the push, to, you know, to get something going like this. So I, I respect that, admire that, and, and think that that's what people should do give back. That's how you can give back, you know, but that's what I'm looking to do. And, and I'm hoping to be able to, to start something like that or, or get involved. I've talked to a few groups that want me to get involved with them, but, but the thing is, is it's gotta be hands-on, you know, not about uh, raising money. It's about help be hands-on helping these kids. Yeah. The bullying is, is a big deal is a big deal, but you see like, even on this platform, we're just talking, the hat is here. Second chance. What is that? Who does it belong to? Now, all of a sudden, there's synergy. There's synergy. And there's things we could do to promote these things. And, and there are people listening to this just from our previous interviews with Francis that are listening to this. And, and they'll, they'll comment and they'll say, you know, you helped save my life that, you know, you sharing your story. So uh, you are making an impact and, and you will be making a bigger impact in the future. Absolutely. I, I strongly believe that. Um, and you've been so generous with your time with us and, and everything like that. I do, I do want to ask you about just a couple more things and then, and then we'll let you go. I, I appreciate everything, Kurt. Uh, so first thing, biggest, biggest regret in your life. If you had to pick one regret and you wanted to tell people that are listening to this, this is my biggest regret and why I wouldn't do what I did or the path that I went down on, what would that be? Oh boy. Uh, I've got regrets in my life. Uh, probably my, one of my big, and again, I don't even know if I'm answering your question here, right. But the, one of the biggest regrets I have in my life was not, there were times when uh, my father was very mean to my mother and, you know, I, I got beatings regularly from my dad. And like I said, I'm not proud of that. And, and, and some I had coming somewhere because I did something wrong. And, and I don't, I don't lump that in with, with the beatings my father gave me for no reason. Those were growing up. I deserved it. I was late. I did something wrong, but uh, I regret not what well, I regret not taking any of those beatings forever sticking up for my mother. Um, I wish that I, I, there was some things that I could have did or should have done to help her, but uh, I didn't. And you know, there, that's a huge regret of mine. Um, you know, as far as learning what I've learned or, or, you know, I, 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 I just wish that, uh, I wish I would have seen, saw things earlier on in my life and, and saw them for what they were rather than let them play out the way that they did. I mean, I saw my dad for what he was. Uh, I, I wouldn't say no to him. And that was out of fear. And so I, you know, I, I wish that I would have looked at things differently then. Uh, and, 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 you know, coming home from prison, you know, had uh, real quickly. So you understand why I feel the way I feel. Um, the gentleman that was working for my dad, when I came home from prison, a gentleman by the name of Ronnie Jarrett, who was a, uh, who I admired. I mean, I, I was a, I was a great guy to me and he was a very serious guy. And, uh, my father wanted me to work with him when I came home from prison and he, he came and tracked me down, Ronnie, and, and, uh, and said to me, you know, you, you're, I'm the, I'm only a messenger here, but your father wants you to work with me. And I said, Ron, I can't, I can't do it. Sorry. And, and he wasn't a guy you'd say you'd, you'd want to say no to. And I said to him, I said, I'm sorry, I can't do it. Um, I explained to him, I said, my, my father didn't help my family when I was away, didn't care, uh, I said, I'm done. And he said, well, I, I'm the messenger. And I said, well, as a messenger, you're going to have to bring that message back to him. And so about a couple of weeks after that, uh, Ronnie got shot and killed in front of his house. And ha had I not walked away 
from him and my dad at that time that either would have been him and I, him or me, or both of us. That would that would have happened too. And that's not me trying to glorify or, or make myself more important. That was a fact. And whoever sent that message was sending it directly to my father because he was working. He was my father's right hand man at that time. So uh, I don't know if that answers the question, but that 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 reaffirms that I did the right thing for me. I made the right choice because of of that outcome. So I'm glad I did that. But I've I've learned that the life that I was sold or, or was my father tried to sell on me wasn't the world that is real the the honor the respect you know in that world your best friends want to shoot you i I don't i i don't i don't see how the word respect or honor could be put with something like that that your own friend would kill you but that's that's that world and you know i have my agreements and disagreements to that but yeah i hope that answered your question yep absolutely uh I'll kind of like beat myself, <laughs> beat myself if I don't ask you the question. But another popular figure that uh, recently did something with Michael Francis as well is uh, Sammy the Bull. You have any run-ins with with him or or anything like that? Nope. I, I always knew the name though because his name in New York was was very well known. And so you know, when I was out there and see people out there, you know, they talked about him and. You know, well, it was long before he cooperated, but, um, you know, what a, what a rough stand up guy he was, uh, you didn't mess with him. You didn't fool around with him. He was, but yet also he was, he was a, a loyal guy. And that was, like I said, that was before, you know, all that stuff happened, but, uh, never had any deals with them. And, um, and I, you know, I, I think Sonny's, uh, Sammy's very entertaining. I really do. I find him. I, and I don't mean that in a funny way. I mean, entertaining in his stories, entertaining in, you know, his views and how he sees things. And, and you know, it's funny because the same with Michael. Uh, these guys are, are older and the ways that the ways that they lived and they think, I, I, I understand that way of thinking. You know, I respect that way of thinking that, you know, the, the, how life was before compared to now. You know, and like I said, I don't agree with you know, everything everybody's done, just like people aren't agreeing with everything I'm saying. But, uh, you know, I, I, it's interesting because it's two different worlds. And I, that one's more entertaining. Their world is more entertaining than my world was by far. Got it. You want to ask him about uh, someone that you really respect and look up to? <laughs> Danny? So you probably heard of somebody named Andrew Tate. And he's gotten a lot of uh, publicity, a lot of heat in the media recently. Thoughts on him? Do you do you know him? Have you really uh, seen his content or anything like that? I've seen very little of his content. Uh, I, I I didn't know a lot about him before. Uh, I'm learning a little bit more. Uh, and Michael's a big fan of his. So actually, Michael brought him up up to me uh, when we were talking and. Um, so I, I don't know much about him, and I I I I just know he's a big name now, and and I know he's going through some stuff. I I think he was in prison. They 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 put him in prison. Is he still there? He's still there, and I think they just extended it for another thirty days. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing with yeah. the whole thing with that is that there's no evidence being brought forth. Um, I actually don't even think there's any charges that are that are filed properly. I think, and they have one or two witnesses that. He's now threatening to sue them for the lies that they're putting out there, according to him. For three hundred million, he he wants to sue one of them. So, I mean, being somebody who's been in the prison system, like, I mean, it's to you. Is it far fetched that the government, in that case, would kind of just fabricate something or just want to hide him or put him in as brother in jail because of the message? that they stand for? Like, is it a far-fetched idea or no, it could happen. It could happen to anybody. Me personally, I don't think it's a far-fetched idea. I, I don't know where he is. What, what, where, what, where is he in prison? He's in He's Romania. In the United States. He's in where Romania. I, okay. So I don't have any idea what the prison system's like there, but I can tell you that from what I'm hearing about Andrew's case, that, you know, that he's, 
you know, that, that, that they're, they're going to hold him accountable for stuff that he didn't do. And, and, you know, in our country, you know, I, I, my dealings with, with the federal government weren't good and, you know, they're not going to be happy with a lot of things I'm talking about because of what they did to our family. But I don't know, you know, what, what other governments are like, how, how they deal with it. But I, you know, it seems to me from what I do know, or the little that I do know is that they're railroading this guy that, that they don't have evidence on him for the accusations that they're making. And, uh, you know, to think that a government has that much control is a little scary, but again, what we're watching, what we're dealing with right now in our country and what you guys are dealing with in your country, it's, you know, it's, I think that's the evidence right there. I think the writing's on the wall, you know, you, you either go along with it or, or, or we're going to hold you accountable for whatever we want to hold you accountable for. Yeah. Or they cancel you. Yeah. Or they cancel you. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> well Kurt it's I've had a great time this has been great man. yeah and we want to close off the show but before we do you want to leave our audience with one last thing and maybe where they can find you how they, how they can connect with you okay uh, well I'm I don't I'm, I'm going to be on more social media platforms I'm, I'm really just on uh, Facebook right now and uh I'm on Twitter, but I'm really not. I don't go on Twitter very often, but I, I check it and I'm learning more about it. I'm very, uh, not, not good with technology. So, but I thank God I got my kids helping me. So, um, but I, you know, I, the one thing I'd want to leave everybody with is, you know, your take care of your family, take care of your kids, kiss your kids, guide them, you know, be a parent, you know, not a friend. And, uh, you know, and, and, and cherish them every day, your family, your, your, you know, your loved ones and, you know, watch their back, have their back, have, you know, look out for everyone in your family, look out for your friends and hopefully they do the same for you. And, uh, and that's, it's my, my life is my life is my kids and I wouldn't have it any other way. Thank God for my kids actually. I love it. Amazing. I love it. Kurt, thank you once again for coming on the show. You've been generous with your time, class act, and I love everything that we heard here. So I'm excited to get this out there. Once again, thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you guys both. It's It's been a a pleasure. Pleasure talking to both of you. Likewise. 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 Yep. All right, you guys. So once again, do your duties, like, subscribe, leave us a comment, share this episode with your family and friends. And until next time, we're out.